personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library, brought to you by Ammo.com. Now, Sam, we have two holidays that honor veterans in this country, and uh, today we're going to talk about the more cheerful one, where you're actually allowed to do fun things and not feel guilty about it. Well, I, you know, I should start by saying I don't think people should feel guilty about having a burger on Memorial Day. No, um, not that, but it shouldn't have kind of a, a festival atmosphere like Veterans Day can. Well, you did, were not my co-host for the Memorial Day episode, but we did a Memorial Day episode a million moons ago, and I basically think, you know, I get why. So the, the Memorial Day, to to recap our previous episode and to uh, begin our explanation of how the two are different, because people kind of just conflate the patriotic holidays into patriotic holidays, but Veterans Day is for anyone who served, and Memorial Day is for um, people who died in in the military with a specific orientation towards the Civil War, which has largely been lost over the years. And when we did that episode, one of the things that we talked about was how in the North, it was always bunting, parade, cookout, fireworks, the whole bit, because it was a victory dance. Hmm. And in the South, it was you go out to the family uh, graveyard and you have a picnic so and like spend time with the dead and mourn the dead um so i think that both are kind of equally valid ways of interpreting it and i think that you know tipping a beer uh in the honor of the dead and blasting uh god bless the usa by lee greenwood uh you know i don't know what else you really like what else you're gonna do you're supposed to sit around saying hail mary's all day i don't um it you you're allowed to celebrate holidays people is what i'm kind of getting at i think that the point about us you know neglecting the meaning of these holidays is 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 appropriate uh and i think that we need uh, you know a kind of as a nation to have more focus on the seriousness and the gravity of these days but i don't think we should be in sackcloth and mourning on you know memorial day or anything like that i mean i'm not and i'm not saying that you're saying that i'm saying that you know, that's definitely like a like a type of person who's who thinks that. I mean, I don't know, man. If 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 uh, if American servicemen and women aren't dying for your right to enjoy a burger without being hassled, I don't know what they're fighting and dying for. I mean, it sounds trite and stupid, but like, I think that a lot of what we talk about when we talk about what we're defending, and when we talk about freedom, is is at least in America what we would call the American way of life, and I you know, celebrate it, man. I mean, celebrate it. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I, I, I suspect that people who are dead, we wish they could share a burger with you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that we can go too far in either direction as usual. I think that the answer is somewhere kind of, kind of somewhere in the middle, not exactly yeah. in the middle, but not like some, you, you, know. you really can't do wrong. I just think, uh, at least include some kind of somber reflection in your Memorial Day observance. Maybe before you go, have a beer and get drunk. Just uh, reflect. Read Flanders Fields and, and just take five. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair assessment. So Veterans Day, as we said, celebrates all veterans ever. Um, it's celebrated every year on November 11th. It was first celebrated on this date in 1919 under the name of Armistice Day, if you're like me and you spent a lot of time looking through, uh, you know, almanacs and things when you were a kid, um, I'm sure that you probably went, what's Armistice Day? But that's, it's Veterans Day under, uh, under another name. Basically, it was named in honor of a temporary ceasefire, which brought about the unofficial end to World War I. Uh, the year prior, in 1918, the Allied forces entered an armistice with the Germans, which stopped live battle 
uh, the eleventh hour. That's where the phrase "at the eleventh hour" comes from. Hmm. Of the eleventh day of the eleventh month of nineteen eighteen. Um, a year later, nearly five months after the end of the First World War, which uh, the official end was June twenty eighth, nineteen nineteen, the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. President Wilson proclaimed November 11th with the first commemoration uh, by saying to uh, and I forgot to boo after Woodrow Wilson's name is slipping <laughs> uh, boo Woodrow Wilson to us in America. The reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride and the heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gr- the gratitude for their victory, both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because it has given and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of nations. Um, I think that that speaks to the point that we initially talked about at the beginning of the podcast that like solemn pride is maybe what we're going for. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, which may include crushing a few tall boys and eating a few burgers. Yeah. Uh, Thinking about it, how else should Americans celebrate? I mean, that's our, our go-to celebration. So yeah, no. yeah. So I think it's, you know, particularly for this holiday, very appropriate. He called for parades, public gatherings, brief moment of silence at 11 a.m. Two years later, on November 11th, 1921, an unidentified soldier was buried at Arlington National Cemetery in what became the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Kind of worth saying for a second that... uh there's tons of guys, tons of Americans who are interred in France and uh, other parts of Europe somewhere, uh, which yes. reminds me of a thing that uh, uh, I think it was Kennedy said. No, it wasn't. It wasn't Kennedy. It was like a, it was some uh, cabinet head. But when De Gaulle um, demanded that American troops withdraw from the United States, somebody might have been Secretary of Defense, said, do you want us to take the ones that are in the ground, more or less, saying like, you know, yeah, you're welcome, buddy. Um, That's France calling. They don't want to be mentioned in this podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you uh, got to add, if you ever just want to shrivel, like I mean cringe, look up videos of people getting reamed out by the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for making too much noise or being disrespectful. That will cut Man. you to the core. Man. Um, I had at not Buckingham Palace, but one of the like secondary palaces at I would would have been 16. Um, I had an, uh, a fully automatic weapon pointed at me because I stepped over a line that I didn't notice. And I was, yeah, I was not like, yeah, as a kid. They're um, allowed to not mess around. I've seen videos of them pushing tourists out of the way just because they were in the way. Beautiful. He got right back into formation like the nanosecond I stepped behind the line. I mean, he was very disciplined. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he definitely pointed his. What do they have? You would know better than me. Uh, uh, his Henry Martini rifle. No, I, I don't know what they carry currently. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't either. But um, I am definitely going to look at that later because I love I love <laughs> to watch cringe. So Veterans Day is about celebrating American military heroes. Uh, it's not just you know the end of the war, but. Uh, And it wasn't just in the United States. It began spreading around the world. There's Remembrance Sunday in Great Britain. Canada has Remembrance Day. In 1926, Congress passed a resolution making Armistice Day a recurring federal holiday, stating that it should be commemorated with thanksgiving and prayer and exercises designed to perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding towards nations. As a side note, the federal government can't force the states into celebrating holiday, not within its jurisdictions, but most states adopt the federal holiday calendar, even for extremely specious ones like Juneteenth. Um, But that's another subject for another time. The ceasefire is believed to have occurred at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Um, that was, you know, the war to end all wars, yada, yada, yada. It was not, and we all know that now. But people really believed that at the time, which always is always a strange thing to me. People really thought, you know, this is the last time there's ever going to be a war because we're going to get the League of Nations set up and um, simpler times, I suppose, is a good way of putting it. 
the Allied forces, you know, are draft the Treaty of Versailles. And um, it's entirely, you know, the Treaty of Versailles has this reputation of being really on- onerous and draconian. But in as much as they allowed Germany to remain intact, it perhaps was not. I don't suggest that they should have broken up Germany or even that breaking up Germany would have prevented another world war. Um, but uh, Austria-Hungary didn't get to stay together and the Ottoman Empire didn't get to stay together. And while Germany lost significant territory, particularly in the uh, Treaty of Brest-Lavosk, or however it's said, I know I'm probably saying it wrong, um, the treaty which they acquired, like basically all of (laughs) all of European Russia um, or good goodly chunk of it, you know, they lost all of that. So they weren't going to be appointing the new king of, of uh, you know, Lithuania and Finland as in their original plan. But they allowed Germany to remain intact as a single cohesive nation state, which they did not do to the other two main central powers. Um, so I, what, what would have happened had it been done differently? But I just wanted to point that out. Uh by the time that the uh, they've signed the Treaty of Versailles, most of the Allied troops were already home, and nobody wanted to stay in Germany and Austria to make sure that the treaty was enforced. The treaty did not require an unconditional surrender, uh, and this is another thing: is that the German military wasn't disbanded, which isn't to say that Germany this isn't like defund the police. You know, we're going to replace uh, cops with social workers or something. Mm. It's just that. It's very, very common to dismantle the military when you take a country like that, you know, fire the officer corps. Um, and even if the same, you know, 80 percent of the same guys end up coming back, you completely reorganize it. So it's a different it's a different beast. Uh, they didn't do that. And they certainly could have done whatever they wanted. So Marshal F- uh, Franz Falk, I want to say that's pronounced of France, Supreme Commander of the Allied forces said at the Versailles settlement, this is not peace. It is an armistice for 20 years. And boy, howdy was that close. I mean, it was exact, it was exact because they, Oh no, they, they, the ceasefire, as I understand the ceasefire was 1918 and the treaty was 1919. So that's, that's right on the money. Yeah. Pretty amazing. He knew he was a uh, smart Marshall Falk. Yeah, I think that that. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's pretty unbelievable how prescient that uh, that you know prediction was, because twenty years later, um, the world, the Second World War starts. Hitler, of, of course, is, was a decorated veteran of World War One, and he was, you know, I think it's inaccurate to say he's like the father of the of the stabbed in the back myth. Which I'm, by the way, I'm not sure that the stabbed in the back myth is a myth, and that's worth noting. Particularly, how do you mean that stabbed in the back? Yeah, so the stabbed in the back theory is the is is the was the theory posited, by the way, not only by the Nazis, but by most uh, people in the conservative to far right spectrum in Germany, because they had a part, they had and have a parliamentary multi party system, and um, it's you know, so it was not exclusive to the Nazis. It was a general sentiment that we could have won the war if it weren't for the politicians. Which, boy, that should ring in your ears right now because we got a bunch of guys coming home from Afghanistan who probably feel roughly the same way. And that is a dangerous, um, you know, dangerous situation. And it certainly has been historically. But basically, the idea was that the German army wasn't defeated in the field, it was defeated by, um, in giant, uh, giant parentheses don't make the joke i know you want to make <laughs> uh you know the jewish politicians was the way that they spun that narrative in the nazi party i don't it's not unclear to me that the narrative minus the anti-semitic conspiracy theory is inaccurate uh i think that in my albeit limited understanding of world war one the Germans were doing pretty good militarily, and the, but the will to fight at home was being broken, and people chose to blame that on politicians. So I think that it's not – I think that like most kind of 
uh, of these insidious takes on history or science or whatever that there that there's a kernel of truth to it that makes it work if it were just wildly incorrect i'm not it's not it's not clear to me that um that they would have had any kind of leg to stand on with it. I mean, certainly people felt that way and they didn't need the Nazis to make them feel that way. No, the Nazis only became popular because the people already felt that way. Right. They capitalized on an already, already existing uh, sentiment. Yeah. So I, I think that to call it the stabbed in the back myth is not super accurate. And to hand wave it away as some kind of fundamentally anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, I think is also inaccurate. I just think that the Nazis crafted a anti-Semitic conspiracy variant of it for their own uh, purposes. But again, at Sam Jacobs, 70 at Sam Jacobs, 1776 on twitter.com is where you can tell me that I'm wrong. So, you know, part of this is what inspires the invasion of Poland that starts World War II, which is was four times as bloody as World War One. Interesting thing to note about that is that they spent, you know, two plus years not really doing anything because that's how much they cared about Poland. But the, you know, the other aspect of that was that there was a whole thing that the uh, British military in particular, but also France, because France almost uh, unified with the United Kingdom around this time, true story. And the notion that they had was one of, I don't have to run faster than the bear. I just have to run faster than you. If you know that joke, the meaning being that if you and I are being chased by a bear who wants to eat a human, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just got to outrun you. And they were sort of chucking countries at Nazi Germany to, I mean, this is what appeasement was about. People think that appeasement was like that uh, Neville Chamberlain thought that Hitler was some, you know, trustworthy, uh, reliable negotiating partner. And he may have thought that more than, you know, you and I would with the benefit of historical hindsight. Yeah. But the goal of the goal of appeasement was just to shut them up for a few years while everyone else got their military together because they knew that they couldn't beat Germany in 1937 and so they wanted to kick the can down to like 1942 and then they could deal with Germany. Yeah, and people were just so repulsed by the prospect of another another war. Yeah. World War 1. God, read about the Battle of the Somme if you're not sure how ghastly the whole thing was. The whole thing is just is just uh, absolute and gas is the right word word for world war one which we're, we should take a minute and and kind of pick this out i mean trench warfare the worst trench warfare movie you've ever seen is nothing compared to what actual trench warfare was like not sleeping for days and um constantly being shelled and shot at and gassed and flamethrowers and um it was it was not it was not fun and there was a uh no you know i think it's a really good example of like military service is a excellent path for some people it's important for our, our our civic integrity but people should shy away people who haven't been in combat especially should shy away from seeing combat as some like life affirming um you know transformative experience that's going to make you a better human being it might it does for a lot of people but a whole lot more people i think you know wish they'd never been in combat there there are other life affirming experiences out there there's, there's no one who could only affirm their life in combat they might have done something else and really ought to have ideally in a perfect world yeah, I mean, I also think that the war is hell thing is not really... The, I mean, again, this is one of those things where... It's not that I think the answer is directly in the middle, but it's somewhere in the middle. And I don't think the war is hell thing is it either, because I think that there's lots of guys, young men, for whom it is a life-affirming experience. And, like, that's... You know, I think that there's, there's definitely a... Um, I think that there's definitely a profile of guy who has trouble to adjusting to life back home, not because he was damaged by the war ne necessarily in the way that people normally mean it, but mm. because, you know, he has to go from 
being being awesome all the time and kicking down doors and fighting constantly and to running a running a, a, a the branch of a bank um, and I think that there's you know young men who are extremely full of piss and vinegar who that's the only option for them is in, in infantry you know and that's it's the infantry or prison basically and infantry is obviously a better you know choice. Um, so I think that both things can be true at the same time and have a certain interplay to them. And the, you know, the main answer is kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, and again, at Sam Jacob, 1776, tell me how I am just all wet. <laughs> the, uh, 16 million American soldiers, which was 42% of combat aged men headed off to battle, um, in world war two, we lost over 400,000 Americans to that war. Many of those men returned home safely, and shortly after that, there was tensions in Korea. As everyone knows, the Korean War begins. Um, when the Korean War actually begins is very difficult to say because it was not officially a war at any point. But um, I, if MASH is at all accurate, the Korean War was 13 years long, and no, it was like three years long, but uh, two years long, something like that. It wasn't very long. That was 1.8 million troops. And by the end of the summer of 1953, the Korean War had come to an end. Um, about one in every two servicemen or veterans, and it was decided that it was time to make Armistice Day officially Veterans Day so that it would honor all veterans from all wars instead of just veterans from World War One. And that's kind of where we are today, though the changes have there have been changes over the years, um, sometimes to the benefit of the day, sometimes not. Federal holiday was made, uh, it was moved to a Monday, along with Memorial Day, George Washington's birthday, which is now the completely lame President's Day, way better when we had Washington and Lincoln's birthday separate, uh, foundational and transformational presidents are not the same as, you know, uh, Zachary Taylor. So I don't know that we need a day for every president. A few years later, between 1971 and 1975, they changed the date again, and they set it at the fourth Monday in October. Americans were not a fan of that, uh, much like the metric system, because they had a lot of emotional ties to that date, and they moved it back to November 11th. Where it is still celebrated, it is, uh, you know, if it falls on a Saturday, it's observed on a Friday, so all the government employees can get their day off. If it falls on a Sunday, the holiday is observed the following Monday, again, for the same reason. I think that that's fair enough. The concept of observed holidays doesn't offend me as much as, like, you know, because if it falls on a weekend, I get it. People got to get you know, their, their vacation day in and blah, blah, blah. People like three-day weekends. Um, but you know, we don't move the 4th of July around and we don't move Christmas around and we don't move Thanksgiving to a Friday cause it's easier. So I'm not like a big fan of just that be dictating when the holiday is, but, um, different areas celebrate veterans day in different ways. Most public schools close normally on the Monday closest to the holiday as do federal buildings, banks, and many businesses, there are parades and celebrations in honor of veterans. I mean, that's the thing, too, that's missing from all of this is like, sure, there's the cookout, but there's the parade. You're telling me the parade isn't 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 honoring America's servicemen and women living and dead, all branches, all times, all wars. Um, I think it absolutely is. And I think that it's like it's more than sufficient. Uh, and, and who doesn't love a, who doesn't love a good parade? This guy right here. I don't like parades, but it's, you know, um, oh. Many areas will still observe the moment of silence at 11 a.m. to remember all veterans. I think that's a good thing to do. I think that's a good practice. I'm into ritual just in general. So, like, I'm, I'm all about everyone taking a moment of silence at the exact same time. I think that there's an enormous amount of power in such things. I don't mean to get too woo-woo about it, but I just think, you know, um, turning towards Mecca and praying five times a day, there's power in that, regardless of what you think of, of anything else about it. Um, American flags at half mast is a common occurrence. So I think that, you know, Veterans Day, I think we maybe have lost our, our United American 
uh, view that military service is uh, undisputably a good thing in the main. This is not about whether or not they're bad soldiers. They clearly are. But, you know, in the main, I think that we, we uh, as a nation, used to recognize the dedication and sacrifice of Americans, veterans. I think that part of the country still does. I think another part of the country really doesn't. And so to back to, to circle back to the beginning of the episode, I think that if you want to do something to show your support for veterans, uh, go to a parade, volunteer or donate to your local VFW, vol- uh, visit a VA hospital and sen- spend some time talking to the men and women uh, who are not able to attend such events. Uh, you know, I, it could be awkward. It would be for me, but like you bring them something that will make their day and like stop in and say, Hey, it's veterans day. I know you're laid up in bed. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I got you, you know, a bottle of makers or whatever it is that you want to, uh, bring them. I think that that's definitely going to be, you know, if you're looking for a way to give back, I think that you can do that with your time. I think that you can do that with your money. I think that you can do that with your empathy and understanding. Um, And I think that that's all a good way to make this about more than just getting blackout drunk on Natty Light and uh, cooking some burgers. (laughs) That takes a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) Trick like Uh, 800 Natty Lights in honor of a lot of Natty. So, you know, I, I, I'm not a like, and I'm also like, I'm not a thank you for your service guy. Um, the only, the closest thing I do is like, I I run into border patrol guys sometimes and I'm like, Hey, if I see a border patrol guy at a gas station, I'll like offer to buy their coffee or something. Cause I know that oh, yeah. border, border patrol guys and ice agents, like every, yeah. all they get is like, what a horrible person you are for keeping children in cages. And it's like, yeah, they're also keeping like heroin and like sex slaves out of the country so they uh the guys are working upstate new york thank you for deporting my girlfriend (laughs) never saw her again (laughs) dave trello confirmed as narc for cbp and ice dropping a dime on his girl Uh, they saw her she said they said you gotta go (laughs) (laughs) well so that's all we got about Veterans Day. As usual, uh, the Resistance Library podcast is brought to you by Ammo.com. You can go to Ammo.com forward slash podcast. Get yourself uh, you know, $20 off any order of $200 or more. We are, ve- are, are we still like super well stocked? Yeah, we're doing great. We got so many options for your most popular calibers. Tons of 9mm, tons of 40 SW, tons of 357 Magnum. For every conceivable application, we got all the major rifle cartridge, 556, 223, 308, 762, that's 51 and 39. And we got every kind of shot shell you could need, your deer hunting, home defending, target shooting. I'm really proud of the, uh, the stockpile we have in our warehouse right now, and I hate to see it go, but I love to see it ship away. Well, there you go. For Dave Trello, this is Sam Jacobs. This has been the Resistance Library Podcast. Again, that is ammo.com forward slash podcast for $20 off any order of $200 or more. We will see you next time.